Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and today we're continuing the top 100 board games of all time, numbers 40 through 31, the 2022 edition. Now, all these games on this list are rated 9s, which means they are excellent games. I always want to play them. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you do. It is the best way to help us grow. Let's go ahead and get started with the list with number 40. Number 40 is going to the game Pax Pamir 2nd Edition, where you play as Afghani tribes during the Great Game. Right now, three large powers are in control of this Afghanistan region, and it's your job to align with one of those factions, but you can switch from faction to faction as the game plays and do your best to accrue either victory points through winning these dominance checks or just by having the most presence throughout the game. One of my favorite parts about this game are the cards themselves. At the start of the game, you're only going to have two options. You're going to be able to take cards into your hand or play one of those cards. And when you play a card, you trigger the impact icons on the card. For example, if you decided to play this fruit market here, you get to put a road in or out of Kandahar. And you also get to change the favored suit, which will affect some of the bonus actions in the game. So you can collect these cards in your hand and then have a chain of successive actions where you're able to evaluate a lot of these abilities all at once. It makes for a very interesting interesting and very fascinating plays as you're able to combo build and prepare and save for later. In addition, each of these cards is going to change its effect based on the faction that you are a part of. For example, if you are part of the British faction that is dominating the region at the time, if you play that Kandahar card, that road is going to belong to the British faction. And that's my other big favorite thing about this game is the faction system. At the start, you're going to decide who you'd like to align with. There's three major factions. There are the Afghani, there are the Russians, as well as the British. And based on who you choose, every time you populate pieces, those pieces are going to be for that faction. You're you're also going to be collecting gifts and taking out targets for this faction and presenting them for influence points at the end of the round. Whenever one of these scoring triggers happens, you're going to check to see if one of these nations is dominant, which means they have way more cubes than everybody else. And if that happens, the players who actually are aligned with that faction are going to score based on their influence in that faction. So the number of targets they picked up, the number of patriots, there's small, minimal scoring inside of there in addition to this large overall dominance. And I think that's really fascinating. Fascinating. The thing that really puts a twist on this is at any time you can take out a target, recruit a patriot from a different faction than the one you're currently aligned with, and then become a player of that faction. This is going to lead to some sneaky, thoughtful plays and will make for an experience that you want to play again and again. So the impact icons as well as the faction system and the smooth of gameplay and that emergent narrative that's going to happen during this great game, that's Pax Pamir 2nd Edition, my number 40, coming in at number 68 last year. My number 39 goes to the game Coimbra. Coming in at 41 last year, this is a dice drafting game. We will be using the dice for multiple things, but ultimately trying to gain influence in these four large tracks while touring around Portugal. Now, my favorite part about this game is actually the core mechanism, and that is the dice drafting. The big thing here is that the dice are multifaceted, and they're going to be used in three different ways. You're going to roll the dice at the start of each round, and whoever is first is going to take a die and place it into one of these rows. These rows are associated with bonuses on the top, and then cards over here in these last three rows. And each of those cards are very important because they will develop your influence in the different tracks, which can result in things like income or traveling or just straight points, as well as an assortment of effects that are going to build your engine throughout the game or give instant one-time bonuses. Now, with that being said, when you take the die, not only do the numbers matter, but also the color. The color is going to determine what action you get to take on which track you activate during the end of the round. So getting dice of specific colors is going to benefit benefit if you've already climbed up that track a lot. The other important thing is the number. The number determines the order in which you actually get to pick the cards on the row. For example, whoever's taken this purple six here is going to pick first in this row. They're going to take the card that they really want. But this is double-sided because the third thing that these dice do are reflect the costs that you actually have to pay. If you go high in the turn order, you have to pay more currency of whatever type the card is. For example, if you wanted this purple card, it costs coins. Since you played a six to take it, it's going to cost you six coins. So you paid for that card, while this person at the end here only paid three 
got a card, may not have been the one they wanted, but hey, they did not pay a lot for it. And this is the choice that I love here. It provides a lot of tension with getting to places first, staking your claim, staking your position, and knowing when to pay for powerful or important cards that you deem important or powerful. So it's up to the players to determine the cost and the currency they're willing to spend for these powerful actions. I love the arc of this game, and I like how it's divided into two halves, how the powers will escalate from the first round to the second round, and I also really enjoy that you get to pick your scoring throughout the game, as well as how to develop your engines. But that dice drafting, that choice is going to be something that intrigues you, but not only intrigues you, it's just super satisfying to play and see how it plays out throughout round to round. So that is Coimbra, my number 39. My number 38 goes to Terraforming Mars. Number 8 last year, this is an engine building game where you play as a mega corporation, doing your best to help terraform Mars. You'll do this by putting out plants and increasing the oxygen, putting out oceans, as well as increasing the overall temperature. At the end of the game, whoever has the most victory points wins, but it's the journey that's really awesome in this game, as the engine building is going to allow you to do lots of cool special abilities, as well as generate a whole bunch of income. One of my favorite parts about this game is the card evaluation. At the start of each round, as well as at the beginning of the game, you'll be offered a lot of cards to pick from, but every card that you decide to keep is going to cost you money, and that's the decision point here. Every card that you are taking prevents you from playing another one. So you have this choice every single round as, do I keep this thing? Can I play it now? And is it going to benefit me if I actually play it right now? Is it going to help build my engine? Is it going to be something that I can build on later? And I love this choice. The card evaluation is so cool, and the amount of cards that you're drawing, and every round you're seeing new ones is so fresh and fun. I love that every single card in the game is unique, which definitely can play into the luck factor, but I love finding combinations of ways to make these cards work and just how satisfying it is to see it all play out. In addition, I love the action structure in this game. On your turn, you get one or two actions. You get to pick. And so you can take small passive actions one at a time in order to see what everybody else is doing and kind of what the planet development, because some cards will have requirements or maybe you're trying to get your timing right on certain things. Or you can take some fast actions to make sure that you do something before someone else can. And I love that choice here and just how it's presented. Things are tense, things are tight, and timing is crucial, especially when it comes to these milestone goals where you are racing to achieve specific aspects of the game first for additional points. Terraforming Mars is an incredible engine building game, and it feels so satisfying to generate loads of income and see your planned card evaluation pay off. Wonderful game. This is Terraforming Mars, my number 38. My number 37 goes to Barrage, a worker placement game where you play in a far-flung future where no longer is energy made the conventional ways, it's all hydroelectric power. This game has you playing and creating these large dams, channeling the water from those dams into conduits, and generating power through power plants in order to fulfill a variety of contracts. The core mechanism of this game is worker placement, and that's one of my favorite parts here. You'll start the round with, I think it's 12 workers, and you'll use those workers workers sparingly or in large swaths to take powerful or small actions. But the timing here is crucial because these actions fill up. It is first come first serve and a lot of times getting a crucial worker in can be all the difference when it comes to making sure your plans come through. You'll have private spots on your own board, but also shared areas. So it's that tension of, oh, do I make sure that I do this stuff on my board first or do I take those spots that are open in the center right then and now? Another thing I really love about this game is the way the water system works. At the start of the game, there's a bunch of neutral dams on the board, and everybody can pull from and use that water. But as you play, people are going to start building their own structures, and they'll have water that's reserved to themselves. However, whenever you use water, it doesn't just disappear, it flows and moves, and I love that about this. This game is all about opportunism, setting up for future plays, and leaning into what your opponents are doing so that you can benefit as well as you can hopefully cut them off and get the edge. This has a lot of great player interaction with taking different spots when it comes to the worker placement as well as the placement of your buildings on the board. I just love how it all comes together in this really cyclical package that just cycles through just like the water present in the game. So Barrage is a fantastic take on worker placement, engine building, and a very interesting contract fulfillment system 
through the use of hydroelectricity. So that's my number 37, Barrage. My number 36 goes to Anachrony. Coming in at 34 last year, this is another worker placement game that has you playing in a dystopian era. The planet is doomed. You've received a message from the future that says, hey, there's a cataclysm coming. You need to prepare. And you're going to do this through the use of this newfound time travel, as well as managing your resources, constructing buildings, and hopefully escaping on time before the planet explodes. Anachrony features worker placement as its core mechanism, and that's my favorite part about the game, is its in and out system. On your turn, you have the option of placing workers out onto this central board, which is populated by these large mech suits. The air is toxic here, the cataclysm has happened, and it's ruined the atmosphere, so you only have a limited number of these mechs that you can place out. But that being said, it's pretty high competition for these spaces. You may have to incur additional costs if you wait too long to go to the action that you really wanted, or you may not even get to take that action at all, and that is terrifying because there's so much tension on figuring out what you need to do first and when and timing everything properly. But instead of going on the outside actions, you can also go inside to your own home base. And these home bases will have these different buildings that you've created that give you some form of resource production and generation and engine building. And so it's a constant choice of, do I make sure that I go out onto the planet to ensure that I'm getting those spaces I need? Or do I try to get maximum value by doing the things in my home base first, all these engines that I've built? It's a great choice that leads to some positive anxiety. Another thing I really love is the way the theme is implemented throughout the game. It makes this game really easy to teach because all the actions are tied to something grounded. For example, the time travel here is a loan system. The more you do it, the more of a chance you have to disrupt the time stream and create anomalies. And if enough of that happens, you're going to create a paradox that you're going to have to fix later. Anachrony also has a whole host of expansions that are all equally awesome and thematic. One of them that I really enjoy is the Pioneers of New Earth module, where you'll be going out on adventures by upgrading your exosuits, and then based on how much science that you've developed, you get to look at a number of events or special powers and try to claim one of them as your own. So it offers a little bit of push your luck, but lots of ways to mitigate it, and I really enjoy that because that tension is still there to be the first on those explorations. Anachrony also boasts a very, very good solo mode where you have this intuitive AI that replicates the tension of the base game, and now with the Chronosis solo mode allows you to play all of the expansion modules in addition to just the base game. There's so much to love in Anachrony with very clean worker placement systems, lots of things connecting, very thematic and great asymmetry throughout with your different endgame conditions tied into your characters. I love Anachrony, wonderful worker placement game. That's my number 36. My number 35, 25 last year, is Spirit Island, a cooperative game where you play as spirits of an island and colonists are here to settle. You'll do your best to use your gigantic major powers, minor powers, as well as enlist the help of the locals, the Dahan, to repel the colonists and save the land. Spirit Island starts off with the growth phase, where you're going to be upgrading your own character. And this is actually one of my favorite parts of the game. You're going to have your own specific way that you take these discs off of your board, and the more discs that you take off, the more powerful you become. You'll be revealing different numbers here, which will correspond to the amount of energy you produce, as well as the different cards that you can play, so the number of cards you can play. And you'll also reveal some symbols here, which will trigger some special abilities, either your innate abilities, which are at the bottom, or on the cards themselves. You reach a certain threshold of symbols, you'll get an additional bonus powered up ability. And I love this system here. Each of them feels very unique with the different ways that their tracks progress. Some are generating a lot of energy quickly. Some can play a bunch of cards, but maybe they can only play cheap stuff. And I love the way this brings flavor to the different characters. After you decide on your growth, you get to play your cards. And this is another thing I really love about this game are the card system. You'll have these cards that are specific to you down here. And there's two different types. There are fast and slow cards. These fast cards you do immediately when you play them and then the slow cards you have to wait until the invaders do something and I love this tension because generally those slow cards are going to be way more powerful but they are delayed so a lot of planning has to go into actually making them work whereas the fast ones can react to things immediately and allow you to be a bit more flexible with setting up those slow powers in addition to that you're trying to check those symbols and keep in mind all of your different growth things there's just a lot to love in this choice.
through the use of your thematic power cards, you're going to be trying to eliminate the invaders or repel them from the island in fear. There's so many different ways to play this game through the different scenario cards, and there's lots of different difficulty levels that you can pick from that are going to make it a varied experience. I love the amount of different spirits you can pick from, as well as Jagged Earth's new spirits that almost double the amount of content in the game. There's so many cool ones to pick from. One of my favorite ones is this trickster god that's going to be randomly pulling some of these minor powers out, so you're not really sure what you're going to get and have to make the best out of these situations, and I really love that. There's also some really cool customizable spirits and just so many great options i love the interplay between the different spirits and discovering the potential on how to repel the different invaders spirit island is so thematic fun tense and very scary and stressful but in all the best ways wonderful experience that is spirit island my number 35 my number 34 goes to the game Root. Number 35 last year, this is a game of woodland warfare where you play as very cute little creatures and you'll do your best to gain victory points or win through dominance checks. And you're going to score victory points in all sorts of different ways because each faction is extremely asymmetric. The moles are trying to recruit nobles. The cats are trying to build buildings. The iries are trying to put out their roosts and get passive points. There are so many different ways to play this game and that's one of the charms. But my favorite part about the game, actually, are the shared mechanisms. The thing that unites these asymmetric factions and goals are the core mechanisms of the game. The movement rules are the same for each character. The battle works the same for each character. And everybody is going to have access to the same deck of cards, which are used a little differently for each player, but all share a same trait that comes in the form of crafting. You can build cards, put them in front of you, and these abilities work with every faction. There's no completely different way that these abilities translate and it's because of those shared mechanisms that make it work. I also love the multi-use functions of the cards, not just for the crafting, but also for activating faction-specific abilities. Root offers excellent solo and multiplayer play and it's only going to get better, especially in that two-player count with the new Marauders expansion that's on its way. Root is a masterclass in asymmetry as it allows you to easily jump into the game by learning the shared mechanisms but doesn't make it unbearable where you're having to learn multiple separate games to actually enjoy your experience. I love the different factions in Root, the gameplay, the interplay between all of the different factions and the players playing those factions, and I love those mechanics that are just solid and foolproof. So that's my number 34, Root. My number 33, coming in at 52 last year, this is Race for the Galaxy, a Tom Lemon design engine building done through a phase system where you're going to be using the cards in your hand to pay for other cards and then do your best to create a space empire. The core mechanism of Race for the Galaxy involves these phases, and that's one of my favorite parts about this game. Every round, you're going to be picking one, two, in a two-player game, and then revealing them, and everyone at the player will get to participate in those phases. So the core mechanism here has you reading all the other players at the table and actually invested in caring what they're doing because you are trying to anticipate the different actions they may choose so that you can benefit from them as well as taking the actions yourself. It feels so satisfying when you're able to chain actions and kind of see what everybody is doing and benefit from each card that is played. I also really love the way that the cards themselves are laid out. Each card has all of the phases on the left here, and they tell you how they affect those different phases. In addition, cards that are a little bit more complicated with their effects will have a little understanding box down here to help you understand those rules for those specific phases. And I love that about this game. There are some shared symbols that exist, but I think that the iconography works really well for easily being able to read and evaluate your different cards. Going back to those phases, I love that each of these phases also presents a choice in itself. In the explore phase you can add new cards to your hand but you have two options with how you want to do this you can dig deeper and you can draw more cards but only pick one or you can draw just more cards but pick a little bit less and i love that choice here you also have ways that you can generate income by selling specific goods or going straight for points through the consume action there's a lot to love here with the way that you have agency in making sure what you want to happen happens but putting that risk out there and trying to anticipate what the others are doing i love 
love the engine building in Race for the Galaxy. I love the multiple paths to victory, and I love drawing your opening hand and picking a card and saying, ooh, I want to play this, and then doing your best to make that happen and seeing how the engine starts running from turn one. Race for the Galaxy remains to be a wonderful implementation of the phase system with bonuses galore, satisfying engine building, and clever card play and evaluation. So that is my number 33, Race for the Galaxy. My number 32 goes to the game at Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. This is actually a blend of two games that we already saw on this very list, Terraforming Mars as well as Race for the Galaxy. It takes the theme and the ideas of Terraforming Mars, terraforming the planet, playing as the corporation, and using project cards to do so. But it uses the phase system from Race for the Galaxy, which once again is going to pull you in and say, hey, make sure you're seeing what other people are doing because you want to make sure you are able to get maximum value from each card that is being played, and you can participate in all of them and try to anticipate and push your luck on those actions. Now, one really cool thing about Terraforming Mars that I haven't mentioned about this, so everything else that I said about those other two games are present here, but the coolest thing about Terraforming Mars are the different modes of play. First off, the solo mode in this game is absolutely wonderful. The AI has a deck of its own action cards, and just like when you're playing with other players, you have some idea of what the actions the enemy is going to be taking. You have a limited amount of time to actually terraform the planet, so you have a set win condition you must complete, and I love that about this game. You'll do your best to evaluate these cards and say, oh my gosh, I know I only have like 18 turns left. Is it worth playing this card? How is that going to play into my faction ability? How am I going to use this to propel me forward? And I love love that about this system. And then on top of that, there's also a cooperative mode that does the same thing, but you're able to communicate and collaborate with your partner, switch cards, but in addition to terraforming the planet, you also have to score a certain amount of points. So there's engine building that's also important in the form of income and victory points, because if you don't meet the threshold of completing the terraforming of the planet or the victory points, you're going to find yourself in challenging positions and losing the game. And I love that about this. There's a lot to love here. The gameplay is satisfying. It retains all of those positives, minus the multiple choices selection, which I think is a big standout in Race for the Galaxy. But I think that everything else is retained here with the card evaluation, with the engine building, the satisfying play, and the anticipation and chaining of the different phases. I love Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition, and I think that it's so wonderful in its simultaneous engine building play. So that is my number 32, Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. My number 31 goes to Kingdom Death Monster. My number six last year, this has you in charge of a settlement of survivors. You're going to do your best to go on these different hunts, taking down these large creatures, bringing them back to your settlement, and developing and innovating and crafting new gear using the body parts of your deceased quarries. There's so much to love about Kingdom Death Monster. Whenever you bring back a quarry, you'll be able to use its body parts to craft items, and you'll be allocating those items into these gear grids, these 3 by 3 squares, trying to unlock abilities and create these perfect characters in order to take down the darkness. In addition, the fights themselves are a lot of fun. You'll have these characters that have these specific AIs that are easily legible. You're able to follow them extremely well, and they're so thematic because they're unique to that specific monster, and they level up with the monsters that you fight. And then on top of that, whenever you attack a monster, you also have these hit locations that will give special events or things that happen based on where you actually attack the monster. And I love this. If you hit its wings, something's going to happen. It might knock off a feather, or you might get sucked in, or a hand might grab you. Oh, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. And the thematics in this game are off the charts incredible. Each of these story events has these large books. I'm not going to show you any spoilers or anything like that. But in addition to that, every character feels like they have something interesting going on. You get fighting arts that will give your characters special abilities, as well as disorders that are going to affect the way that these characters play. They're all thematic to this nightmare world that is present in front of you. The artwork is absolutely stunning in Kingdom Death Monster and really plays into this theme of this dark world where you're not sure what's around every corner. I love the variety in the characters, the monsters, the weapons, the classes, the combinations, and the sense of danger that permeates throughout the whole experience. You have to keep in mind when you play this game, you are not these survivors. You are this omniscient being that's doing your best to help the settlement as a whole. So it can be very scary when you get attached to specific characters and they may not make it out of a fight. And then having to see the fallout of these actions as they move from scenario to scenario. Every line of text in King 
Kingdom Death monster is flavorful and efficient in storytelling and mechanisms. I love Kingdom Death Monster, an absolutely incredible campaign experience where you are going to watch as you progress and get better at the game as you play, as you wade through mystery, danger, and altogether a fun time. That is my number 31, Kingdom Death Monster. And that's the list. Those are my top 100 board games of all time, numbers 40 through 31. What did you think of the choices on this list? Anything surprise you? Any games that you think shouldn't be on this list? Anything you think should have been higher? What were you most excited about? Which games are in your top 100? What were your 40 through 31? I'd love to hear what you think. But thank you so much for watching and for sticking around. Side Game Strong.